Thank you for listening and supporting The Daily Memphian. Sign up for one of our many free newsletters and breaking news alerts at dailymemphian.com slash email to receive the latest local news stories impacting our community. Our weekly newsletters cover everything from sports to arts and culture, business, food, and more, along with daily updates of all the news we publish each day. Sign up or manage your email preferences at dailymemphian.com slash email. This is the Daily Memphian Politics Podcast. I'm Bill Drees. The main event is Shelby County Election Commission Chairman Brent Taylor on new voting machines. Top of the podcast, the Shelby County Democratic Party sets the date for its local convention to elect a chairman and new executive committee. Noon, August 14th at Wooddale Middle School is the first of the two gatherings. That to select delegates to the second gathering, usually two weeks later, where the choices are made. Running for the chairmanship of the local party is Gabby Salinas, who was on this podcast in May to talk about being on the board of Fuerza, the statewide Latino Democratic Political Action Committee. She has also been a Democratic nominee for State House in 2020 in one of the two closest races in the Shelby County delegation to Nashville, and of course, Democratic nominee for the State Senate in 2018. The local Republican Party, you may remember, uh, used the same two-step convention process until this year, when they combined both into a single day's work in April, Kerry Vaughn selected as the new chairman of the Shelby County Republican Party at that gathering. Look for formal moves at the city council and county commission later this summer to appoint a new consolidation charter committee about 11 years after the last drafting of a consolidation charter. In the November 2010 dual referendum, one within Memphis and the other in the county outside Memphis, including the six suburban towns and cities, the consolidation charter lost by a wide margin in the county and just barely won in the city. City Council Member Chase Carlisle and County Commissioner Reginald Milton will be leading the charge before their respective bodies. A campaign committee is being co-chaired by former City Council Member Jack Sammons and businessman Tyrone Burroughs. At the Shelby County Commission this past week, no contest for Dr. Michelle Taylor, the new Shelby County Health Department Director. Her nomination by Mayor Lee Harris approved by the commission unanimously, 13 to nothing. A large show of support before the vote that continued Harris's push for her confirmation after some on the commission questioned an early recommendation from one of several search panels who urged Harris to continue the search and look for someone else. Taylor will get the chance to hit the ground running. She starts as the county health department is weighing new policies on the COVID resurgence and specifically whether to use the local health department's autonomy from state health directives. Willie Brooks is the new chairman of the county commission starting September 1st. Brooks is among the six commissioners in their second and final consecutive terms of office by county term limits. He will be chairman for the last year of that second term of office. This was a three-round contest for the seven votes to take the chairmanship among Brooks, current chairman Eddie Jones seeking a second term, Jones and Brooks both Democrats, the third contender, Republican Brandon Morrison. Morrison got one vote from fellow Republican Mick Wright on the first ballot, otherwise no support from the three other Republicans on the commission on the second ballot, which eliminated her from the third round, becoming a runoff between Jones and Brooks. She did get the vote of Democrat Van Turner in the first two rounds, Turner, a fan of Morrison's recent support for expanding Medicaid in Tennessee, which she called on the new health director to push the state for. And there was also her push for the extra funding for the Memphis Area Transit Authority without a property tax or wheel tax hike during the budget season. So where were the Republican commissioners? backing Jones along with Democratic Commissioner Edmund Ford Jr. With Morrison out of the running on the third ballot, Turner and Morrison gave Brooks the seven votes needed to become the new chairman. Morrison, who has been chairman pro tem for the last year, also shut out by Republican commissioners in the race for the number two spot for the next year. That also went three rounds and wound up being between Democrat Michael Whaley and Republican David Bradford, with Whaley taking it with eight votes. 
Ford passed in all three rounds of that. Whaley picked up every other Democrat and right to make eight. Ford will be watching closely to see what committee assignments look like in the coming year with Brooks as chairman. Ford has been budget committee chairman for the last year, and when Jones was budget committee chair the year before, he and Ford were the team that rejected Harris's budget and began the commission's march to build its own budget. Judicial Commissioner Danielle Mitchell Sims moves to General Sessions Court Division 3 to serve out the last year of Judge John Donald's term of office. She was the pick of the county commission to fill the vacancy starting in August. Like the other seven contenders who applied for this appointment, Mitchell Sims intends to run for a full eight-year term in Division 3 on the August 2022 ballot in the set of judicial races that makes it the longest ballot in Shelby County politics. Over to Nashville in federal court there, a class action lawsuit against Tennessee Governor Bill Lee and his administration over their decision to end $300 a week supplemental unemployment payments from the federal government to unemployed Tennesseans that cut off just before the 4th of July holiday. The plaintiffs are Tennesseans who saw their federal payments cut by the executive order. Among them, a woman from Shelby County identified only as CM in this John Doe filing. CM was diagnosed with COVID-19 and unable to work. With the state's decision to end the federal supplement, she says she is facing eviction and her utilities are about to be cut off. The lawsuit claims the state's decision creates a hardship on CM and the others that the CARES Act funding was approved to alleviate. It seeks an injunction requiring the state to take back Lee's executive order and restore the federal funding. And once the case is decided, if they prevail, to require the state to make retro payments to the unemployed dating back to the July 3rd cutoff. In Nashville State Senate Republican caucus members with a public statement urging Tennesseans to get vaccinated, this after Republicans in the legislature were criticized for vaccine hesitancy and even opposition. It was both that prompted the administration of Tennessee Governor Bill Lee to sack the state health department's director of vaccinations and end all programs promoting any and all childhood vaccinations and immunizations, not just COVID. That included canceling notices of second doses of the COVID vaccines to children already scheduled to get them. Back to the caucus and its letter. Quote, under no circumstances will the state of Tennessee require mandatory vaccines or vaccine passports for adults or children. We recognize this is a personal choice. The letter also says efforts to get more Tennesseans vaccinated, quoting again, have been hampered by politicization of COVID-19. This should not be political, end quote. This letter was signed by 16 of the 27 Republicans and the 33-member state Senate and the Shelby County delegation to the Tennessee legislature. Paul Rose signed the letter, while Brian Kelsey, the other Shelby County Republican in the upper chamber, did not. When the county's next health directive is issued August 4th, expect the Shelby County Health Department to go along with the guidance this past week from the Centers for Disease Control that recommends but does not mandate wearing masks indoors for Shelby County. That's the indication from Shelby County Mayor Lee Harris. Tennessee's two Republican U.S. senators reacting to the CDC recommendations. Marsha Blackburn tweeting, quote, mask mandates undermine vaccine confidence. Bill Haggerty, quote, I thought we were following science. I fear this will undermine confidence and significantly hurt efforts to encourage vaccinations. Back to the county commission, no surprise that the body voted this past week to reject the Shelby County Election Commission's $3.9 million contract with ES&S for a touchscreen machine system with a paper readout fed through a digital scanner and kept as an audit trail. A majority of the commission was already on record for some time as favoring hand-marked paper ballots. The surprise was a later add-on resolution this past week from Commission Chairman Eddie Jones in instructing county purchasing to get ready to take bids on a new voting system and one that is based in hand-marked paper ballots, not the touch screens. The resolution passed in what amounts to an end run around the election commission and further teeing up what looks more and more likely to be a battle in court over who has the authority under state law to pick and to take bids on a new voting system. 
the county commission, or the election commission. Joining us now to talk more about all of that is Shelby County Election Commission Chairman Brent Taylor, who is also a former Shelby County Commissioner and City Council member. Uh, Mr. Chairman, right at the top of this discussion, can the County Commission take bids on a new voting system outside of the Election Commission? Well, I, I believe it's problematic on a, a couple of levels. One, I'm not sure that the County Commission would even know how to write the specs uh, for the bids. Uh, so I'm not sure that... that um, that they would be able to uh, write the, the the specs for the request for proposal, which would ultimately lead to the bid. So, because none of them are election professionals, as a matter of fact, you know the election commission itself is not made up of election officials. Uh, we're citizens who provide oversight for the election commission staff, who are professionals with many decades. Uh, of experience in conducting elections. So I'm just not sure that the expertise exists at the county commission in order to put together good specs that we would get um, a good outcome in terms of, of bids. Uh, right. That's issue number one. Issue number two is uh, the state is providing funding, uh, part of the funding for the election equipment uh, that's always the case. The county, the, the county provides a portion of the funding, and the state provides a for, portion. I'm not sure that the state funds would be available if the county commission had a go it alone approach. Uh, that I'm not sure the state would would fund their part without our consent. And so I, I think there are a couple of challenges uh, related to the county commission with a go it alone approach. My preference would be uh, to to do what I have been saying from the outset is I would prefer to work with the county commission and let, let's get beyond this uh, impasse. I think there's a way to do that. Um, and we have demonstrated a willingness to do that by coming to the county commission first and foremost with that hybrid approach where we would allow the voters to decide each time they vote how they prefer to cast their ballot, whether it would be with a hand-marked paper ballot or a ballot marking device. That's been done in other jurisdictions. Um, but the county commission turned that down uh, and they, because it, the bid did not match our original contract. So we went back with strictly ballot marking devices, which is what the bid was, and uh, uh, attempted to get that passed the county commission and, and they voted against it. Mm -hmm. and, and we talked some about this as, as I was writing the story earlier in the week about how and how important the uh, specifications are when you put something out to bid in, in any government setting, just about. It, it, it's kind of like getting getting all of the different sides who are going to bid on the contract to, to know that the terms are the same and also to get what you, what you really want to get. You have to have very specific uh, bid specifications and they have to be fair to to everyone who might conceivably bid on this, right? No, no that's correct. Uh, matter of fact, I was on the city council years ago when we actually had to rebid uh, motorcycles for the police department uh, because the administration had written the specs so narrowly that only one company could meet the requirements or meet the specs. Uh, the specs. And uh, ultimately, we were sued by a, a vendor that was not the winning bid, and uh, and we actually had to rebid that. So there are dangers in uh, writing specs uh, that you write them too narrowly, you wind up with challenges. If you write them too broadly, uh, you wind up with bids that really aren't even comparable to one another. So it, it really is a delicate balance, and that's why I think it's important that the county commission uh, work with us and let's work through this impasse uh, because the county commission simply does not have the expertise to uh, put out uh, bids and, and do this uh, on their own. The election commission voted earlier this year to authorize a, a lawsuit over the issue, which would be in chancery court. Is that lawsuit more likely to happen with the two actions by the county commission this this past week? 
I can't speak for the body. Um, We obviously have a decision now from the election commission. One of the things I committed to the election commission that I would not reappear uh, before them on this same bid. So uh, we will meet at our next meeting and I will uh, report to the election commission that the county commission uh, did not fund the contract. And we will look at all our options. Uh, And the options are we could simply acquiesce to the county commission and uh, do handmark paper ballots. And there's some real challenges there is one reason we aren't prepared to do that, uh, at least immediately. Uh, the other option is we could simply put it back out to bid, uh, come back with the same thing that we did before. Uh, and the only difference will be it will cost more. Uh, and then there's also the option that we could simply go to Chancery Court. I don't know which option the commission will will take, uh, but we have options available to us and we plan to take that discussion up at our next regularly scheduled election commission. So so let's let's get into the handmarked paper ballots. What what is the election commission's opposition to that? Well, there are there are several reasons why we think handmarked paper ballots are not good for Shelby County. Uh, Number one, there are a number of capital expenditures that are not necessarily election equipment related that the county will have to to pay for in order to do paper ballots. Number one is the ballots have to be kept in a fireproof storage until the contestable period is expired. What that means is if a losing candidate wants to challenge the outcome of an election, we have to preserve those ballots and protect them uh, from damage, from fire, water, what have you, uh, until that contestable period has expired. Beyond that, uh, we are also required to keep the ballots, um, that we have to retain those ballots for 22 months. So essentially two years, we have to keep ballots um, protect them and keep them in storage. And again, uh, that, you know, imagine paper ballots by the hundreds of thousands uh, and those have to be, you know, organized by precinct. And so it will take, you know, a a storage facility to do that. Uh, Additionally, um, there are significant printing costs associated with handmarked paper ballots because when they're pre-printed handmarked paper ballots, we have to have, um, the correct ballot face for the voters. Some precincts um, are split among city council, county commission uh, districts and municipal districts and so forth. And some precincts could have as many as 17 different ballot faces in a single precinct. And so we have to have, uh, in that case, we would have to have 17 different types of ballots Uh, available for the voter, depending on which uh, ballot they're supposed to receive. Uh, It will take additional poll workers um, to do the handmarked paper ballots because the uh, unvoted paper ballots have to be accounted for uh, twice daily and matched against the number of voters cast at the precinct. So essentially, we would have to have uh, dedicated poll workers that are essentially inventory in those ballots, checking them against the uh, pe- number of people who have voted and keep a constant accounting for those uh, those ballots. And that would take additional manpower that we currently don't have to, to have for that. Um, the other issue is that voters are far more likely to receive an incorrect ballot with handmarked paper ballots than with ballot marking devices simply because of human error. Whereas the computer, um, you know, unless, you know, unless somebody inputs the wrong name or um, name of the voter in there, the the voter will receive the correct ballot. And with handmarked paper ballots, there are a lot of opportunity for human error in giving somebody the wrong ballot. Uh, Handmarked paper ballots also, we feel, disenfranchise the immigrant community who does not speak English as a primary language. And uh, because ballots in Tennessee are only required to be printed in English and uh, with a ballot marking device, with the touch of a button, 
the ballot can be translated into any language that the voter happens to speak and so they can cast their, their ballot. I find it interesting that nationally the Democrats uh, want to make it easier for people to vote. And that's why they have, have been against um, voter IDs. They've been against um, a, a whole host of what Republicans view as ballot security measures. And But the argument that Democrats have made is they want to make it easier for people to vote, not harder. But in this case, the Shelby County Commission Democrats are perfectly willing to disenfranchise immigrant voters simply because they don't speak English, because they have made no effort to make sure that they could vote in the election. And uh, with, a hand, with, a pay, uh, with ballot marking devices, immigrants who don't speak English can cast their vote. Uh, disab the disabled community is also affected by hand-marked paper ballots. Um, and there are actually a couple of lawsuits in other jurisdictions that have not been resolved yet where the disabled community is suing because their voters are treated differently at the polling place uh, because they are required to vote on ballot marking devices by law. And so therefore they are processed differently and they cast their vote in a different manner than able-bodied voters. And those lawsuits have yet to be resolved. I can give you as an example, my, my wife who is legally blind, uh, currently she can go into a polling place and vote on a ballot marking device because she can zoom it in, she can enlarge the ballot, she can change the contrast where she can read it and she can cast her vote and she does it just like all other able-bodied voters. With hand-marked paper ballots, she is not able to read a paper ballot so therefore, she would have to vote on a ballot marking device, which is segregating her and treating her differently and processing her differently than able-bodied voters. And uh, so I think the disabled community is uh, impacted by hand-marked paper ballots. But, but would there have to be a provision? If, if Shelby County had a hand-marked paper ballot system, would you still have to have machines there under provisions of the state law to, to allow people to vote on, on, on those machines for specific instances like that, because, because there's also a provision in the state law that said that um, if, you, if you have the system that you wanted, which uses touchscreen machines and has a paper audit trail, that you would have still had to have had an option for paper ballots as well. So, so uh, aren't there some exceptions to that? I mean, not everyone would, would have to vote a paper ballot under under different circumstances. Well, they would they would be uh, they would vote a paper ballot unless they were um, disabled, for example, uh, as my as the example of my wife, uh, who would not be able to read a, a paper ballot. She would vote on a ballot marking device. But but pursuant to federal law with the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have to have ballot marking devices available for disabled voters. And you're correct in that paper ballots would be required for people who we, uh, if we had ballot marking devices, we would still need some number of paper ballots for people who um, we cannot determine their eligibility to vote at the precinct, then they would uh, vote on a provisional ballot, which then would be determined at a later date if they were eligible or not, once we can investigate and do due diligence on that. So they would not vote on a ballot marking device uh, because you can't retrieve that vote once you determine they're ineligible. And, and, and you can run a paper ballot through the same digital scanners that we part, that would be part of the system that the election commission prefers to. That's correct. And matter of fact, under the original proposal we made to the county commission, our hybrid proposal where a voter got to decide if they wanted to cast their ballot with a paper ballot or hand marked, uh, hand, uh, I'm sorry, under the hybrid proposal we sent to the county commission, the voter, if they cast their vote with a paper ballot or a ballot marking device, the same scanner ran both. And uh, so the scanner can read both a hand marked paper ballot and a ballot that's been marked by a ballot marking device. Sure. So, so what, what I'm wondering is, is it, is it that big a deal to kind of just flip that thing of, of saying, all right, we're, we're going to have touchscreen machines with a paper audit trail 
and we're going to have the option for handmarked paper ballots, is it that big a deal to say, okay, this is going to be a system that's primarily based in handmarked paper ballots, but you have the option to vote on a machine if if you want to? I mean, well, that, that, that would be true, except the county commission turned that down. Okay. Okay. But, but, that, was but exact, that was exactly what we were suggesting right. to the county commission. And uh, we would have worked with the county commission to develop a policy of how we would have presented that to the voter so that we're not leading them one direction or the other. It's very similar. You go to the grocery store and you uh, are checking out and they ask, ask you if you want paper or plastic. Voter shows up. Do you want to cast your vote with a paper ballot or a ballot marking device? I, I that guess was, that, I that guess was that, our original proposal that we made to the county commission, but they turned that down. I guess that's what I'm asking. If you if you worded it differently, or or if you had something that that by their perception was was not leading voters, as, as, as some of the critics of this said, then could it could it go through? Do you think? I mean, would that would that be something you'd be able you'd be willing to, or the election commission might be willing to go along with? Well, I I can't speak for the county commission, but if it got us beyond this impasse, that is an option that I uh, I, I remain committed to is to have the hybrid system where voters decide how they cast a ballot. To me, I thought that was a win win for everybody. I thought it was a win for the county commission. I thought it was a win for the election commission. And most importantly, I thought it was a win for the voter. So rather than the county commission determining how voters cast their ballots, and rather than have the election commission determine how voters cast their ballots, why don't we have the voter decide how to cast their ballot? And the county commission want to know part of it. And I would have been willing to work with the county commission, and I think my colleagues would have as well, in developing a policy of how that's presented at the polling place so that we don't tilt or lead the voter into choosing one or the other. I mean, we're accustomed to that when we're asking if people want a Democrat ballot or a Republican ballot in a primary. And so we know how to phrase questions in a way that we're not leading the voter. But we were never given that opportunity. The county commission just said no. Mm -hmm. have, have you had any contact with commissioners since uh, Monday's vote? I have spoken with one commissioner since Monday's vote. And and what what was what was the uh, general tone of that? The uh, general tone was that they were just explaining their vote, and um, it was uh, a no vote, and they were simply explaining their vote, why they voted the way they did, because they had voted differently back in the fall when uh, our first contract was up for county commission approval. Mm -hmm. um, it, was a, you, it was a very cordial conversation and uh, and it just simply uh, taking the opportunity to explain their vote because I did not get an op, uh, they, they did not get an opportunity to speak to me at the commission meeting. Right. But because the, uh, because the second vote took place later in the meeting, it was an add on item that, there was no advance notice of, and and I believe the election commission was was meeting itself at about the same time as this was all going on, too. Correct. the The election commission meeting started at four o'clock. The county commission meeting started at three, and uh, I actually had someone else chair our meeting so I could appear before the county commission, and the county commission voted down our contract which is fine. It's within their prerogative to do that. Uh, but what I thought was, uh, what I thought was inappropriate and I would, and I've served on legislative bodies and I would have never done this to anyone uh, was to wait until they leave uh, and then vote on a matter that they would have had input in, but they uh, chose to do so after the County commission and our staff had already left the building suddenly they developed enough courage then to uh, to vote for uh, a resolution to, I guess, conduct elections on their own. Mm -hmm. We we will, uh, of course, be having the other the other side on the paper ballot question on on future editions of, of this podcast. But you you said something to the Election Commission that that uh, you thought that that if paper ballots are are the system 
that when that goes out there, there are going to be a lot of upset voters to whom uh, who, who are not going to like this system and, and the way it works and are going to have problems with it. And, and the question is, then, where are those voters and the politicos who, who don't want that? Because the dominant voices in the debate so far have been those who want to do away with voting machines as we know them. Correct. And the dominant voices have been that, but they've been the only ones that have really been engaged. The average voter, uh, as much as I may not like it, as much as you may not like it, Bill, the average voter is not engaged with uh, a a debate between the county commission and the election commission on how we're going to be casting our votes in, in upcoming elections. Most voters are busy raising families, uh, emerging from this pandemic, uh, trying to get back to work. Uh, They're trying to earn a living, pay the mortgage, uh, get their kids back in school. Uh, Are we going to, you know, are we facing another lockdown? Are we facing further mask mandates? Those are the topics that average voters are concerned with. The average voter would not be concerned with how they cast their ballot until they show up and find out we're casting ballots the same way we did in 1958, 63 years ago. And I think they would be shocked to find out that they are going into the polling place and given a paper ballot to fill out when for the last 63 years, they have voted on some type of voting machine. And I'll go further. I would say that the millennials, and I have two children, uh, one's 24, the other is 21, and they don't do anything on paper. Uh, One is in law school, the other is at Mississippi State. They take their notes in class on a computer. When they uh, go home, they order their food on their phone. Uh, When they fly, they get their ticket on their phone. When they uh, order their food, when they... um, Uh, schedule to go to concerts. They do that with their phone. They order toilet paper through Amazon on their phone. They do everything digitally. And so when you have a whole group of millennials who show up at the polling place and you give them a piece of paper and a number two pencil and tell them to fill it out, they're going to look at the election workers like they have three eyes. And it will only be then that they will suddenly realize that I need to get engaged with somebody to change this antiquated way we're casting votes. Uh, So I think there will be a huge awakening if we were to actually do hand-marked paper ballots. I think there will be a huge awakening after the first election that people who have been disengaged and allowed the minority dominant voice on hand-marked paper ballots to prevail, uh, I think the county commissioners will... uh, hear from people like they've never heard from them before. So you think it will be a reaction to, to just the, the technology or the lack of technology? Because I have to point out that paper ballots have, have made some progress since 1958. If we went to a paper ballot system, those ballots would be fed into a digital scanner to keep a record of them, as well as the paper record. So it's not like it was during the Crump days, when you just had someone looking at the ballot and saying, yes, this is how it's marked, trust me on it. Well, you'd be surprised, Bill, that maybe they haven't advanced as far as you might think <laughs> they have. Um, it's still a bubble you fill in. And uh, for the voter who follows the directions and actually circles in the bubble only one time in the for the candidate of their choice in a race, yes, it would work that way. But what happens more cases than not is you get voters who uh, circle the bubble, they put an X in the bubble, they don't do anything with the bubble and instead circle the name of the candidate, or they vote for two people in the same race, or as in the case in Germantown in 2016, they don't bother to flip the ballot over and miss voting on a whole host of races. So what happens to those is they they get fed through the scanner, but uh, they're uh, not accurately read because the ballot had been filled out properly. So those go off to a separate section where a bipartisan team then has to go through 
and look at each individual ballot and try to determine how the voter intended to cast that ballot. And we all remember the 2000 election down in Florida where they used a butterfly punch card, which I might add is a handmarked paper ballot. Uh, you used a, a pen and it, it was a punch card. And we all remember those images that drug on for days and turned into weeks of the election officials looking at those ballots, trying to determine the difference between a hanging Chad, a pregnant Chad, a dimple Chad, an overvote. And that's the same scenario that we would have. We would have teams of people looking at ballots that have uh, indiscriminate marks on them, trying to determine the voter's intent. And I think therein lies the danger. If we go to hand marked paper ballots that, uh, that, that a political party could take huge advantage of that and then be able to take individual ballots and go on the court and have ballots dismissed, which means votes are taken away. And through this whole process, I'm, I'm beginning to believe that, uh, that the Democratic Party, and I'm going to be, I'm fixing to put on my partisan hat. Okay. Uh, but I believe that the Democrats actually want cloudy elections on election night. They don't want clear winners. Ballot marking devices give you clear winners on election night because it produces a perfect ballot every time the scanner reads it and tabulates the votes and the polls close at seven o'clock. By 10 o'clock, we can have clear winners with ballot marking devices. With hand-marked paper ballots, when we have close elections and we have a winner that's won an election by a few hundred votes, then I believe the Democratic Party would like that because then they can take all of those ballots that have indiscriminate marks or overvotes or undervotes or they marked an X instead of filling in the bubble. I think they want to be able to go through and cherry pick the Republican precincts where ballots may not be a perfect ballot and be able to go into chancery court and sue their way to victory. To take a ballot and say this voter, uh, this voter's ballot is uh, spoiled beyond cure because they've, it's got an X here instead of bubbling it in. So judge, we're asking you to not count that vote. And All what right. I'm saying is not, uh, is not uh, fiction. It has happened. Norm Coleman in Minnesota uh, was uh, a U.S. senator, and Al Franken defeated him, but he didn't do it on election night. Norm Coleman won the election on election night, and when the Democrats were done suing, Al Franken won the election. That's why I believe there's such adamant push for handmarked paper ballots among Democrats is because they don't want clear elections on election night they want cloudy elections so they can go to court and sue their way to victory. They can't, that, do, that. They can't do that with ballot marking devices. All right. On that note of contention, we will have to end. Our Zoom feed is, is running out on us as it usually does in these discussions. Uh, and more to come on this. Our guest has been Shelby County Election Commission Chairman Brent Taylor. A reporter's roundtable on WKNO's Behind the Headlines this week. Our guests are Matt Stroud of the Daily Memphian, Toby Sells of the Memphis Flyer, and Karanja Ajanaku of the new Tri-State Defender. Lots to talk about here, including to remask or not to remask. The bridge closing reaches its end after 86 days. And the Arkansas bridge inspector who got fired and talked. You can also hear the show on our Behind the Headlines podcast, which includes an extended conversation beyond what is on the TV episode. Subscribe to The Daily Memphian at dailymemphian.com. Subscribe to this podcast and our others at Google Play, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. I'm Bill Drees. The Daily Memphian Politics Podcast is produced by Natalie Van Gundy. In-depth journalism in the Memphis community, The Daily Memphian is of Memphis, not just in Memphis, and seeks to tell the stories of this city. TheDailyMemphian.com. Truth in place.